Good day, Martin. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to allow me to video record this conversation. You had some questions for me, but before we get into that, would you please introduce yourself to our audience? Uh, thank you very much, Guy. And let me first say it's a pleasure to even be having you respond to my curious questions. Uh, to introduce myself, my name is Martin Wanjohi. I'm based in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. New to the field of instruction design and new to performance, uh, performance technology. And it's a path I wish I had found earlier, but they say your morning begins when you wake up. So, and I've been trying to catch up. So, I've, and this is the source of all the questions that I have, around which make this session uh, to be. All right, well, thank you for that introduction. And yeah, so where do you want to start with your questions? Go ahead. Okay, so let me start by Gilbert, right? We'll get into the lighter part. Uh, and I've been wondering when Gil Thomas Gilbert talks about worthy performance, what does he actually mean? Or what's, what's an exemplary performance? Well, exemplary performance or an exemplary performer is what I have learned to call a master performer. They are somebody who's performing the job at a level of mastery. So they have met, they are meeting all of the standards per the all the measures for work performance. And, and by performance, uh, Gilbert usually used the term accomplishments to describe worthy performance, worthy accomplishments, or worthy outputs. His business partner back in the 1970s, the late 60s and up through the late uh, 1970s was Gary Rumler, who was my main guru, my main mentor throughout my uh, early career. And he used the term outputs, the outputs of performance, and Gilbert was using the term accomplishments. So whatever task performance is done produces accomplishments or outputs. Now I have some of their workshop materials from 1972, and you can tell there may have been a little tension between the two of them about what language to use, because oftentimes it said accomplishments or outputs or it said outputs or accomplishments. So I think that they were stuck on their two terms, but it's really all about producing outputs, which to me then are inputs downstream. So you produce a script and I produce a storyboard, and then we give my storyboard to somebody else and they produce a video. So there's a series, a chain of tasks uh, that produce outputs that lead to more tasks and different outputs that lead to, again, more and different tasks and outputs until it's all done. When some final customer receives whatever they wanted or needed or they bought or were it was given to them, and then they did whatever they needed to do with it, and so it continues. So the whole notion, I think, of exemplary performance is producing outputs uh, that by performing tasks, and both of those sets have to meet stakeholder requirements. That's something that I think I I didn't add to it. I took some notions from Rumler and Breathauer and some others uh, that talked about there's an input process and output diagram. That's a pretty standard uh, viewpoint, if you will, of process performance. It's kind of comes from the quality movement, perhaps, or perhaps earlier than that. But there's a receiving system for those outputs. And you need to understand, I think, when you're doing instructional design and when you're doing performance improvement, that people are producing outputs by performing tasks. And that all requires behaviors. That all requires certain knowledge and skills. Um, but that those outputs go someplace. They go downstream is the what I learned to think about it from the quality movement, there was upstream and downstream and there were work streams that came together producing things and they went downstream to ultimately to some customer um, or to the customer's customer. So we've gotta be uh, cognizant of 
who is downstream? Who are those receiving systems? And what is it they want? Those are the downstream customers. But there are more stakeholders, if you will, than just customers. There's perhaps regulatory agencies of the local governments where we operate or where our products are going to go to operate. So there are a whole bunch of different requirements for outputs that various stakeholders have. You know, it's got to be safe. It's got to, you know, perform uh, as needed by the customer. Um, but but so there are could be many, many different stakeholders. Back in, when you're performing tasks to produce those outputs, there may be different stakeholders. There may be government agencies that care about how you do that work. They don't care about the output, but they care about how the work is done. And there are other stakeholders, government agencies that care about that output. They may not care about how it was produced. So we've got to look at both the tasks and the outputs and understand the stakeholder requirements. That's where measures come from. That's where standards per measure come from, from the stakeholder requirements. It's not just about the customer requirements. You know, the customer is not king, uh, an unfortunate notion that uh, some promote. But the customer is not king, but there's various stakeholders because if the customer wants something, but the government says that's against the law, we'll fine you, we'll throw people in jail. Well, who's the king? It's mm -hmm. certainly not the customer with requirements that are contrary to government regulations, laws or codes or whatever is the governing uh, set of requirements. So we need to think about all of that. So exemplar performance is when you can achieve the stakeholder requirements with the outputs that you produce by the tasks that you perform. And then those of us who are in instructional design need to look at, well, what do you gotta know to be able to do? So what are the enabling knowledge and skills that are required by the performers in the task performance to produce those outputs? Now, when you're looking at this from a performance improvement lens, you're looking beyond knowledge and skills. Now, there are, very, there are various models, and we'll get into this in a little bit with one of your other questions, but but performance is, is about enablers way beyond knowledge and skills. I mean, if I have the knowledge and skills to do the job, but the data I'm using is poor, or the tools and equipment that I'm using are inadequate, uh, or the requirements are unclear and confused and wrong, then I'm not going to be a good performer. I mean, I'm capable of doing it, but the system that I work in won't allow me to, won't make it easy enough or may actually inhibit my ability to perform to standard. So uh, the quality guru, the late uh, W. Edwards Deming talked about the system. And he said, he, he used to say 86% of the problems, and then he changed it to 94%. He was a statistician from Western Electric, from AT&T, way back in the day before we became famous helping Japan recover from World War II by improving their quality. But he said 94% of the problems are due to the system, not to individual performers. And individual performers are not in control of the system, their management is. So he would pin the blame or the credit for quality issues, problems or opportunities, good stuff, bad stuff, back on management. And so the, that's one of the things that when we are doing instructional design and we're doing the analysis for instructional design, we need to understand the performance context. What are the tasks performed? What are the outputs to be produced? What are the stakeholder requirements? What is needed in the environment for the performers to use to produce outputs? What data do they use? What equipment and tools do they use? What are some of the issues, the barriers that they might face? And then one notion we need to look at is, so if there are people that are performing at a level of mastery and there are others who are not, and this is very typical, we need to look at the exemplars, those people who have mastered the performance and figure out, well, what is, what is it that they are doing that's different from the novice performers or the non-master performers and understand what tricks that they've learned, you know, through trial and error 
and informal learning, what have they learned and what can we extract from them and package it and give it to new people and the non-master performers to help them perform better, faster, and cheaper. So maybe, uh, and maybe just to pick up on, uh, on this again, um, the performance improvement. There is a notion that um, improving performance from the aspect of HR, instead of, for, and I, I came across this and it shocked me that HR actually do performance improvement programs and there is the performance improvement potential, right? And I think that's what you're uh, are talking about where you have a novice novice uh, employee and one who has perfected the mastery. But then we could talk a little bit more about the performance improvement potential. What exactly is it? All right, so, we... so Gilbert yeah. referred to this. This was Gilbert's PIP, P-I-P, Performance Improvement Potential. So what's the difference between, what's the delta or difference between the master performer, what level are they performing at, and the novice performer or the non-master performer, where are they performing at, and what's that difference? And what's that worth to us? Now, let's say that you and I are performing uh, in some job. It could be a, a factory job. It could be an office job where we're producing, let's just say we're producing uh, storyboards uh, in an e-learning function. And, and you are performing them better and faster and cheaper than me. And your, your storyboards have to go through three iterations before they're done. You know, they go through a review and then you update them and then they get reviewed again and you update them and finally you're done. Mine takes seven. So mine takes longer and costs more to produce that. Well, what's that word? What, what is it worth to the organization to get me to perform at your levels? And so we can figure out, well, how much time labor hours are, are is Martin spending versus Guy? And let's just say, oh, I'm going to make this up. You're spending uh, 30 hours and I'm spending 70 hours. So what's the hourly rate for that? That's just one aspect of the performance improvement potential. We could save 40 hours worth of work if we could only get Guy to perform at the level that Martin is performing at. So what's that worth? So that, you know, depends on what the labor rates are and the, the fully loaded rate. And, you know, there's lost opportunity. Mine takes longer to get it done. What's that? Is Does that cost us anything or is that no big deal? Or yours is ready, you know, way before guys is. And so maybe there's a financial advantage. Maybe there's a customer satisfaction advantage when you do the work versus me. Customers are mad because mine's taking longer. What's up with that? And and but so there's many different aspects that we can look at. But I think it all comes down to what I learned from the quality movement uh, of the late '70s and early '80s, and that is we're trying to help people and systems. We're trying to help people and processes and organizations perform better, faster, and cheaper. So we can look at. Well, if it's better, if it's quality, what differences is there between the average non-master performer and the average master performer? And there's always, you know, ranges in that. But so we can begin to figure out, well, if it's worth a million dollars, well, let's go spend a hundred thousand to fix that because then we get nine hundred thousand dollars to the good. Uh, yeah. But if it's if it's if it's costing us the problem or opportunity, it's costing us a million dollars but it'll be, take $990,000 to fix it. And then there's $10,000 of profit or, 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 or improvement. That's may not be worth it because you might be able to take that $990,000 and spend it elsewhere and get greater returns. So one of the things about performance improvement potential, Gilbert's PIP, is that it's a kind of equivalent to return on investment which is used to determine, you know, what's the value of investment opportunity A, B, or C. We can't afford them all. Which ones should we do? And, and so that helps us understand, you know, and level the playing field, field, level the numbers and assumptions and et cetera, so that we can make a, a, a better business choice about what opportunities to follow. In the quality movement, um, uh, 
uh, let's see the what was the guy's name? It was um, oh, it's, it's Philip Crosby came up with this notion of the cost of nonconformance. So if we've got a problem, what's that really costing us? Is that a million dollar problem, a thousand dollar problem, a hundred dollar problem, a ten cent problem? You know, what's it really worth to, to that the problem is costing us? And what's mm-hmm. the and that was known as the cost of nonconformance, C O N C. And then there's the cost of conformance. To fix that, what's that going to cost us? Well, the cost of nonconformance is equivalent to the return on the investment. And the cost of conformance, what we would invest to fix a problem, well, that's the I in ROI. So there's a lot of equivalency here. And I think that depending on what your organization that you're working with uses to make these business decisions as to whether to do something, and what to do or not do anything at all what you know what's their language what's their financial algorithms what what language do they use if you're talking to the quality movement that's going to be different than if you're talking to hr and if you're talking to the finance organization they use something different so when you're dealing with a customer or a client as a consultant or whether as an external consulting or an internal consultant you need to speak the language of your business. And if you're in a manufacturing type of organization, usually they're going to use manufacturing language and they're going to look at finances uh, in terms of ROI. If you're dealing with the quality organization, they're going to look, they're going to use different language. So it always depends and it's always local. And even if you're working for the same company and you go from one manufacturing site to a different uh, office site, they could be using different language. And and so you need to determine that in terms of how to best talk with, uh, talk at, um, explain yourself and your methods and what you're hoping to achieve. You need to use their language. They do not care to learn our language unless it really, really works and then they want to know more about it. That's been my experience over the past 40 some years. Okay, Th- thanks. So, and, and I'm just wondering, and you just mentioned 47 years of experience. So maybe the next question I'd ask is, what would one really need to know to do well in the field of human performance technology, performance consulting, and also performance-based instruction design? Yeah, so I think that um, if you're going to, I'm gonna start with uh, performance-based instruction, which is a subset of performance-based improvement, because if I was a process engineer, well, I'm all about human performance technology. I just certainly wouldn't call it that because the the phrase human performance technology and what, what the late uh, ATD, when they were ASTD, called human performance improvement, which is the means to the... Uh, HPT is the means to the ends of human performance improvement. So the the technology word in human performance technology refers to the application of science, not to computer tools and digital tools or mechanical tools. Technology means the application of science. So human performance technology, which in the old days was called performance technology, is all about the science of improvement. And so what facts do we have? What data do we have? How do we know what works and doesn't work? And under what conditions it works or doesn't work? Um, And so if I wanted to be successful in that, I think that I need to really learn about... um, I th- so there's, there's the whole, there's a whole set of things within human performance technology in terms of how to do analysis and how to do project planning and how to look at the various interventions, you know, do we change the recruiting and selection system and then we're done, that should fix it? Or do we need to change the process that people work in and the software tools that they use and that would fix it? Do we need to improve the process and the data that's being used because sometimes the data is suspect and out of date? Um, And do we, when we do these other interventions, Do we need to retrain people that are doing the job the old way and we need to train them the new way because there's a new process and new data and a new software tool? And, you know, if we maybe it's close enough that they ought to be able to figure it out informally and we don't need to do a thing instructionally or we need to add instruction into 
the solution set. So I need to understand the, this whole notion of human performance technology. And a lot of that has to do with how you do the upfront analysis, what the late Joe Harless called the front end analysis, many different names for that front end analysis. But you need to learn how to do that and how to look at and diagnose the situation that you're facing, whatever scope that is, and understand what are the outputs that people are trying to produce? What tasks do they perform? What enablers need to be in their performance context to help them perform that? Who are the customers downstream? And, and who are the other stakeholders? And what do they require? And how well are we meeting those or not? And I need to learn, I need to think about that. So I also need to know, I think, about many of the aspects of total quality management. There is these two approaches kind of grew up in parallel. They're, they're the same, but different, or they're different, but the same. And so there's a lot of similarities, but there's different language and different imagery that's used as they convey their thoughts, their concepts, their models, their methods, their tools, their techniques. But we can borrow from them. I've been doing so since 1981 when I came across that when I was an employee at Motorola in their training organization. So I think that HBT, there's a whole body of knowledge about that. Um, there's the total quality management, TQM movement, and there's a whole body of knowledge around all of that. There are various human resources because if we're dealing with people and, you know, all performance is a human endeavor. So whether we're doing things for quality, there's people involved. Maybe they're not, you know, maybe we've automated the processes, but there are technicians who, you know, do maintenance and, and uh, continuous improvement of, of technology. So they may be the humans in the performance uh, context. But we need to understand certain aspects of human resources and what are the local laws that human resources must comply with. Uh, what are the contracts that we that our organization has to comply with? So I think the other major body of things, if it's not HBT and TQM and HR, would be business finance. So you need to understand, you know, how do companies make money, and you know what what do they. What uh, is our earnings before in, uh, uh, income taxes and, and interest payments, um, EBIT? So what, you know, what are, how do organizations measure themselves? And financial measures are one of the key things because you can be doing really well with quality and quantity, but go bankrupt. And so you, to sustain an organization, it has to be financially viable, but to be financially viable, it has to meet the quality requirements and the quantity requirements and the schedule requirements of serving their customers and then treating their employees well enough that they don't just leave. And so how do you, you know, attract a, a talent? How do you retain that talent? How do you train and develop that talent? How do you give them career advancement opportunities? So there's, there's a lot to this. So, I think one of the other notions about this for people who are interested in getting involved in this is that you need to learn a little bit about a lot. You cannot start off saying, I want to be a master of all of that. No, you, you could, but I think that's a long, hard climb uphill. And I think that you're better off by saying, I want to play in this niche and become expert in a niche but I need to understand all the other players that I might need to collaborate with because no one individual is going to solve a major organization's critical business issues. And if we help our clients by addressing some of their critical business issues, it's going to take a team effort to diagnose what's going on, to design a solution set, and then to implement a solution set. So my example earlier where we have to fix the process, we have to fix the software in the process, we have to fix the data that are, is available to people, and we may need to train and develop our people in this new process. So it could take a team effort of many different disciplines to fix performance. But I, the person who's doing instruction, need to understand a little bit about all of that. 
I it might have been my project to fix people through training, but I uncovered early in my analysis efforts that the people know what they're doing. It's just that the process is no good. The software tools that they're working with is no good. And the data that they have to work with is not adequate. And, and therefore, the solution is not training. I can help my client avoid training investments that won't do anything except add to the expense column. And uh, But I can help them look at what the situation is, what some of the root causes for their problems are, and then maybe I'll be asked to lead the effort to make the improvement, but most likely not. I'll be a team player in the collaborative efforts of a cross multifunctional team of disciplines who will then tackle further diagnosis, further design of a solution set, further implementation of a solution set. And then, of course, we can all sit back and measure, did we have an improvement? Did we meet the PIP, the performance improvement potential? If it was here before and we thought we could get it to here, did we get close enough to our goal to make it have worthwhile? So that uh, that's a long answer. I'm sorry. That's all I have for you today is long answers. Perfectly okay. Now, um, just looking at uh, from what you're sharing, we need various sets of knowledge, knowledge about nearly everything based in the organization and humans and be willing to work with others and learn. Now, what are some of the models that you'd say, well, if you're getting into this business, these are good models to know and work, be able to work with? So this is tricky. They come from these, these, these different areas, the four areas that I talked about. They come from human performance technology. They come from total quality management. They come from human resources. They come from uh, finance. And But I think that for those of us who are starting in instructional design, um, there are the models and methods of the late Gary Rumler and the late Tom Gilbert and the late Bob Mager and the late Joe Harless. These were four uh, thought leaders uh, at the beginning of human performance technology, back when it was simply called performance technology. And so they have different models. I have my own model. I've written books about this. I've written articles. I, I share them. And I combined one, two models, the Ishikawa diagram from Japan in the 1950s, all part of their quality improvement efforts post-World War II. And I combined the Ishikawa diagram with Tom Gilbert's behavior engineering model. And he is sometimes called the six box model uh, by my friend, uh, Carl Binder, who has taken Gilbert's behavior engineering model, which had very clunky language in it and simplified the language to make it more accessible to, to practitioners and their customers. But so, but my model is this combination where I look at there's three major sets of variables. There's the process itself. You know, was it designed to meet the stakeholder requirements or not? You know, is, is it perfectly designed to do what it's supposed to do? Produce outputs, worthy outputs that meet stakeholder requirements. And then we can look at, well, the process includes the tasks as well, but there's a bunch of enablers, two sets in my model. So there's the process, and then there are there are the environmental enablers. And then there are the human enablers. So the human brings to the process, which has got data and information and tools and equipment and materials and supplies um, and facilities. You know, am I in a clean room where the air is purified and there's it's dust free? Or am I in a factory where the windows are open and there's dust blowing all over the place? Uh, and what is the consequences? So there's an environment. But the human enters and the human brings knowledge and skills, but they also bring physical attributes. Maybe their work requires me to work under a stressful situation uh, and do heavy lifting. So now I have some physical requirements for the human, but I also have psychological requirements. 
is the person that we're hiring, can they work under stressful situations? Well, yes or no is the answer. Uh, are there certain intellectual uh, attributes that they need to bring? Do they need to be strategic thinkers or concrete thinkers or both? So can they do the strategy planning and the tactical planning? Can they think in conceptual terms and concrete terms? You know, not everybody can do that. And so, and what are their values that they bring? You know, if I am biased against certain groups of people, maybe I'm not a good fit for the job because I need to work with all those different kinds of people and I cannot show my prejudices. And so these there are many variables of the human that enable performance or inhibit performance, just like there are many environmental variables that either enable or inhibit performance. But one of the things I learned from the late Gary Rumler was he always started with the process. One, is there a process? Are people following the process? If not, why not? And, and so if you can put all the enablers in place, but if the process that they're following isn't adequate to the demands of the customers and the other stakeholders, well, then the enablers either are right or wrong for the process in place. And the process itself is in place, right or wrong, based on what are the stakeholder requirements for outputs and tasks. Um, and so I, I think if you're starting off in instructional design and you're trying to help people perform better, you need to have a mental model that you can follow when you diagnose what's going on here. What do people really need to know about the tasks that they're to perform, the outputs that they're produce, the stakeholder requirements for all of that, all these enablers, how do I use this data? How do I use this equipment and tools? So we have to help the person survive and thrive in that performance context. And, and so therefore we need to be able to diagnose on the front end, we need to be able to do analysis or discovery on the front end that helps us build better instruction. Now to me, instruction is both performance guides and or learning experiences, what some might call resources and courses or job aids and training, bunch of different language for these things here and it keeps changing over time. But but so we can reduce the people's requirements to memorize everything if we can simply give them a sheet of paper that's got a set of instructions that they can follow when they need to. Because if I'm trying to do the annual inventory, I certainly don't remember this from last year. I, I may need to refer to something and guide my uh, conduct in the annual inventory this year. And I may have done it successfully last year, but I've forgotten most of it. And if I try to rely on my memory, my faulty memory, I'm not going to do as good a job. So most of the time, we in instructional design to help per improve performance, we can give people performance guidance, you know, step-by-step -step instructions, how to think through things, how to go through different branching scenarios, assess the situation, decide, oh, I, I can't do A or B. I've got to go route C this time because of the situational variables that are in place. So not all performance is rote, and we need to figure out, so what are the various uh, performance responses that people need to make given the situation that they find themselves in? And what do we need to give them? Does the job require that they perform based on their memories? There's no time to reference anything. They've got to respond right away. And so therefore, we need to help them commit these things to memory. And if they don't use them very often, we may need to use space learning to keep it evergreen in their mind, ever fresh, you know, keep it at the top of their minds and in memory so that they can use it when demanded, when it's called for. But most of the time we can give people guidance that they use when needed. And if they use it often enough, they'll begin to commit it to memory. But if it's an annual inventory, then they're never going to commit that to memory. So, uh, so, guy, thanks for that. So, I'm the, I was just thinking, within an organization, where does performance improvement fall in in the organization structure? Who's actually responsible for that? 
All right. This is uh, this is an age old question as to where should this performance improvement capability exist within an organization, and there is no right answer. Um, I know of pharmaceutical companies that have put HPTers, people who practice human performance technology, in with their quality organization. And I know of other places where it's in a human resources function within a big uh, enterprise. Uh, other times it's out in operations where, you know, so, so it is again, uh, so, I'm sorry, but the answer is, as always, it depends. It depends on how the organization is currently structured and how they think about it. Now, performance improvement practitioners generally uh, come out of training functions, learning and development functions. Um, but that is taking the concept of instruction or training or learning and expanding upon it greatly. So there is a need for good training and good education in an enterprise we need to onboard people and educate them we need to help them master their jobs through training we can call that learning we can call it whatever but but is that the place to do this kind of performance improvement it could start there but then it could move into be its own entity uh, perhaps it's part of hr perhaps it's part of operations um so there's there is no one answer um it's just like if you were a consultant where would you go to try to sell human performance improvement human performance technology approaches well it depends on where the need is the hr people might be looking at a situation and think they need to bring in some help to help the other organizations and maybe the finance organization is having trouble or the sales organization or manufacturing or merchandising. So, so you can come into an organization almost at any point at, in any functional area and look to help them improve their own operations, help them start to perform better and faster and cheaper, not on, every aspect of their operations their their functional responsibilities but every functional entity hr or sales or finance or od or quality they have their own products and services and they may not be part of the products and services that the enterprise renders to its marketplace but they could be producing their own products and services as a support organization. You know, if you're in the training or learning organization, you're producing training or learning, but that's not going to the ultimate customer of the enterprise. That's going to internal customers, internal users. And so I, you know, I'm sorry that I don't have a, there's no good one answer to that. And I don't think that people should expect that there is a perfect one right place. You know, should we have our own seat at the table sitting with the C-level executives? Well, maybe if the challenges the enterprise faces are big enough and that that somebody from HPT should be sitting at the table hearing what's going on, what the challenges are with current state operations and future state, you know, strategic and tactical things in the future that we're trying to get to, Um so uh, I don't think that, and I've been, I've heard this dialogue, this question about, you know, where should we sit, you know, because we don't like where we sit. If we, if we're in training <laughs> or learning, we sit in the HR world. We don't like that. Um, and, and we think we should be closer to the operations. Well, if training is to serve all of the enterprise, then HR might be the place for it to sit. Uh, the issues that it might have with dealing with the end customer the the heads of operations the heads of quality the heads of finance the heads of sales whatever um that's could be because the hr processes that eventually involve us may have middlemen sometimes known as hr business partners 
who are out there, you know, saying, oh, I can get you some learning content. And and then they come back and bring an order. And then we're we're left with that. And we don't get a chance to figure out, well, what's the real issue that's causing this request for learning? Is it really a learning need or is it something else? But one of the symptoms or one of the knee jerk reactions that t- way too many people make is that, oh, there's a problem. Let's fix it with training. That's our knee jerk reaction. We'll just fix it with training, with learning. And so, but then that doesn't work. And then our reputations suffer and nobody knows really what's going on when they should have figured out in the first place that it's the, it's the equipment that people are using is not being maintained often enough. And that's why they have perf- poor performance. And the people are getting beat up there uh, because they're, they're, they and their machines are not producing quality. It's getting a lot of rejects, poor yields increasing the cost, reducing the profitability, and everybody blames the people because no one knows to blame the machinery and the maintenance system. So it could be that the maintenance people, their budgets were cut. They don't have enough people to do all the maintenance that they should. So they're not doing it because they can't because they've been starved and it's the machines and it's way over in another part of the building. And so people aren't making the connections, uh, drawing lines between the various dots to figure out, well, what's going on, what should be going on and what is going on and what's that difference and how do we address that? And and, uh, as you're talking, I'm just thinking about my journey and I'm seeing I developed an interesting strategy. I think at about the same time that I started doing instruction design. And I think I've had you over and over about saying, about strategy and knowing the bigger picture of the organization. I'm just thinking knowledge about strategy and strategy execution, which would have the performance expected, is, is, is the no good knowledge area for someone in performance consulting uh, to add to curiosity. Yeah, you must be curious and you must be able to find your way to getting the insights about what's going on. Uh You know, business strategy, the strategies of an enterprise are usually secret. We don't tell the whole world so that our customers know what's going on and Mm -hmm. our competitors. We would tell our customers if we were sure that it wouldn't get to our competitors because we might lose whatever strategic advantage we would have at being there first with something new and different. So people in quality, people in HPT, people in instructional design, people in HR don't always know what's going on strategically. What are our strategies for the future? What are our plans for implementing those strategies at a tactical level? And it may be somewhat secretive, um, which is appropriate to keep it secretive. And maybe the head of HR knows about something but the head of learning and development does not because it's too secret. And we don't know who to trust with our secrets because we're there trying to take shareholder equity, money invested by other people, shareholders, and maximize that so that they will continue to invest with us and won't you know, take their money out of our business. So we're, we're it's a balancing act that of our leadership in order to operate currently at a high level of performance and then move into the future, whatever that might be. And, but we in learning and development are there to support them. And we in human performance technology or total quality management, we're there to support them, current state operations and the future state. And, but we, aren't always going to be in the know about the future state. And there may be business decisions that are being made that we don't fully understand. It may look stupid to us that the company is not investing in making an improvement and training people in this one group. But maybe that group won't be there in 12 months. Maybe they will be moved to some other new part of the business because we're getting out of that business and going into some other new business. And they can't tell the world that they can't tell us that because it'll get to the world. And so it's it's challenging. Um, and, and that's something that 
leadership managers being good leaders need to sometimes help their people understand that we don't we can't know everything we have to trust our leadership that they're making good decisions now of course they won't always be making good decisions because they're humans but but we, that's that's the best that we can do we can try to do our job to the best of our abilities and if we're given directions that don't make sense to us perhaps they make better sense greater sense at a higher level in the organization so th this has been a challenge and i've faced i've worked with groups who were very uh despondent depressed angry that their that their leadership wasn't listening to them wasn't doing what they had recommended and come to find that their recommendations uh were valid but not if you were going to get out of that business in 12 months then then it made no sense to do anything about that but you they could be told and so but they were angry and there was worries that people were sabotaging other things because they were so angry you know they told they had been told that they were empowered and then they found out that they weren't now to just to look at from uh, things from a uh, performance and improving performance <coughs> from another perspective where we're designing and developing learning that we aim to help improve performance. What's the minimum? Because we've seen, uh, okay, recently developed an interest in Ghana, and I'm like, I should have read this earlier, right? And, and uh, Mary Law, so first principles of instruction. And I keep on saying, I need to read Ghana to understand Mary Interesting, this just came up yesterday, but, if we are to, to design instruction that will help improve performance without looking at models, without looking at, at, at instruction strategies, what are the minimums that we should have in our learning program? So the minimums are that we, so I think of instruction in three buckets, different types of content, information, demonstration, and application. So application are application exercises, otherwise known as practice with feedback. So what, what the minimum for me for instruction for a learning experience is that I've got to know what people are supposed to do and what they're supposed to produce and figure out what they got to know to do that. And then I need to have them practice that. So when I do, when I go from analysis to design, I design backwards. I first design the application exercises, the practice with feedback. And we decide, uh, do we need to have one practice session, two, three, four? What's, what's going to get the person to be competent enough and confident enough to go back to the jobs and do it? Can they just do it one time in a practice session and get some feedback and that's done? Most likely that's not sufficient. And so there needs to be multiple practice exercises, application exercises. Then, depending on the audience, do they already know what the job looks like because they've been in the job for a while and now they're going to a learning experience, to training? Do I need to do a demonstration before the application? And to demystify it and say, okay, let, we told you about it. Let's show you what we're talking about. Let's do a demonstration. This is the performance we want you to do. Pay attention. Stop the tape. Point out some key issues or safety issues or whatever. Then start the tape again. You know, do you do a slow motion demonstration? Do you do a regular speed? Do you show them it from this angle and then from that angle and then from this other angle? You know, what, what's required to give them the demonstration of the performance that we're trying to enable? that we're trying to teach. Then we go into the practice exercises, the application exercises. But then what minimum, absolute minimum information do we need to give people so that the demonstrations make sense so that they can be successful in the application exercises? So the minimum that we need to give people in a learning experience is that. The information, uh, demonstration, and then application exercises, multiple exercises, because if it's worthy of teaching people, we and it's high risk or medium risk, 
you know, what are, what's at stake? What are the risks and rewards? Are they high? Are they medium? Are they low? And and so that's how much effort we should put into the instruction, depending on, you know, what's at stake? What are the performance stakes? Um, if, if, if people don't need to memorize something, then we can give them what, what Rumler and Gilbert called guidance, what later was called job aids, what's nowadays called performance support or workflow learning. Um, we can give them a paper or digital guidance to tell them step-by-step step what to do. Um, sometimes that's adequate. We just need to say in a learning experience, oh, here's three different uh, performance guides or job aids or performance support instructions that you'll use when you're doing A, B, and C. And that enough is said, it's that simple. When you get to the job, use these sets of guidance for A, B, and C. But when you're doing job task D that produces an output, there's no time to refer to anything. So you're going to have to memorize this. So now let's do information demonstration and application. So instruction, learning experiences, or performance guides need to be as short as possible, but as long as required. And the what's required is that people are able to use these things back on the job. And either we've pr helped prepare them and maybe it's not just our instruction, our e-learning or our webinar, maybe, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe there's a requirement for the supervisor and or the peers of the learner to help with transfer and building impact back on the job. So sometimes we can take people and give them a learning experience and then send them to the job and they struggle. Maybe there was a role for the supervisor to be played and we're not in control of those supervisors and what they do day in and day out. So when we work with our clients and our stakeholders, when we're doing a project, we need to help them understand what do they and their organizations need to do because we're doing this learning for them. We're not doing learning for sales for the learning and development organization. We're doing it for the sales organization. So sales leadership, managers, supervisors. If you want this to work, here's what you got to do. We're going to train your people and send them back to you, but here's what you've got to do. You got to do this at the beginning. You got to do this a day later. You got to do this a week later, whatever those things are. We need to help provide guidance to the management of the learners so that they can play a role in the learning and development and the transfer and the impact that we're all trying to achieve. Uh, but too often, learning organizations produce a bunch of content and, and managers don't have a clue about it. They may not even agree with it because maybe it's not performance-based. It's not performance-oriented. It's got face validity. Oh, yeah, sounds like we should be able to use that. But when you look at it, it doesn't have any performance validity. You know, everybody needs active listening, but maybe not that active listening. Our use of active listening in our roles over here is different than what you've packaged. So you've got good content, maybe for somebody else, but it ain't for us. And so minimally, we need to make sure that our content is focused on the authentic performance requirements of our target audiences. And we've got to stop trying to serve all target audiences with one size fits all generic content, we need to make sure that there's practice with feedback and that practice has to be authentic. Please don't put me into practice exercises for somebody else's job. I want it to be reflective of my job tasks, my responsibilities, my outputs, my performance context. Don't train me in a clean room with bright lights when I got to do this in the middle of the night in a rainstorm. Because if that's my performance context, your training better prepare me for doing it in a realistic way. Now, maybe you start off with a clean room and with bright lights, but then you move it into dark and you pour rain on top of me and, and get a water hose out and, and, and simulate the real world work context because that's what I've got to go back and that's what you're trying to prepare me to do. 
So we need to do our analysis so we understand all of that. We need to work with our clients and stakeholders to make sure that they understand that they have a role to play in some of this. Not always, but often enough that they are really responsible for the training and development of their people, that what their people learn, what their people do on the jobs. We are here to support them. We can't make everything all better for them without their active involvement. Oh, I think that's that's way more than I'd hoped for. <laughs> and it fully answers that question and stimulates some thinking around everything that you're talking about. Um, maybe we mentioned about Gilbert, just to go back to Gilbert and, and uh, the six boxes. And I remember reading this comment uh, from Gilbert about the, 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 the model that came out of it that maybe just to have a look at Gilbert's model, because I know it was very, it is very comprehensive and at times very difficult to understand, right? So, and uh, from it, I know six boxes is what came out from it, but there was this comment that kept, caught my eye as a comment made by Gilbert that it didn't such scratch the surface. So yes, it's deeper. Uh, maybe just a overview for someone who, who just like a quick crash on Gilbert's model? Yeah, I so so I was given uh, Gilbert's book nineteen seventy from nineteen seventy eight, a year later in nineteen seventy nine, his book Human Competence, and it was one of three key things that I was given my first day in the job out of college, and I started I I had two failed attempts at starting to read that book, so it was a very difficult read for me. It was really written in an academic style. Uh, he was a, a student of uh, B.F. Skinner's and uh, he was taking the work of B.F. Skinner and gonna take it into uh, organizations rather than it being in an educational realm or in an academic realm, he was taking it into business. And so he made his modifications. So I cannot recite to you off the top of my head what mm -hmm. the six boxes are. Now I used to have big framed pictures of the behavior engineering model that sat in my wall in my office back uh, uh, 20 years ago. And I also had, he had another model on the, on the page before the behavior engineering model, which was the model for creating incompetence. And that was my favorite model of the book. It had, it had six boxes as well. And I would show that one to my clients first, because we used to hand out Gilbert's book, to our clients and say, this is really what we're all about. Until we wrote our own book in 94, we used to give out Gilbert's book. But but so uh, so part of it is what what's, what's the human bring? There was one row of things and there was, what's the environment got to provide? And I, the challenge is, so I, there have been many people who have taken the behavior engineering model of Gilbert and, and uh, made adaptations to it. Um, Carl Binder, who I mentioned, he's still very active. Uh, he's getting near retirement as well. And uh, he has refreshed and made the language much simpler. So people should take a look at what Carl Binder is doing. Um, and he's got a notion out of performance thinking. So it's like design thinking, but performance thinking. And he's but so he's got the six box model. That's what he calls it. But uh, Roger Chevalier, the late Roger Chevalier, he also took a crack at uh, updating Gilbert's behavior engineering model and showed how to use it there. And um, oh, there's another gentleman now. I'm blanking on his name. But uh, I have resources. I've been gathering resources from the thought leaders of human performance technology or performance technology or performance improvement. Again, a lot of different names for this on a site called HPT Treasures. And it is at hpt.wordpress.com. And it, it so I, there are many different resources there that one might follow on that. But so the whole notion of Gilbert's behavior engineering model was to take a look at a situation and diagnose, you know, do the people have the knowledge and skills that they need? Do they have the incentives that are needed to motivate people to perform? Um, what are the tools and equipment? 
Um, these are some of the six boxes here, but I won't try to do do them right now because I don't have them at, at in my head because I've been not been using the behavior engineering model. I mean, I learned it. I used to use it. I used to talk about it. It was a framework that I used, but then I got exposed to the total quality management movement at, in 1981. So two years later, and I began to merge some of these models and concepts into my own set. And I think a lot of people in our business do that. They're working in an enterprise where there's prevalent models and methods and concepts and tools and language that are being used, and they adapt everything to fit that context that they're working in. Um, and so when you learn people's models and methods and concepts and tools and techniques, know that you probably cannot benchmark them and use them as is. You can benchmark them, begin to understand them as they're being used in a, one context, and then figure out what can you adopt and what might you have to adapt to make it fit your context. Um, and so I, that's a key lesson. I think too many people try to take some of these very valid, very useful models and use them as is. But as one example, Gilbert uses the term exemplar. We talked about this earlier. So he talked about the exemplar performer. And so I used that term at Motorola back in 1981 with manufacturing clients. I served manufacturing, purchasing, and materials. And, and I was meeting with my clients, 30 people in a room, and I used the term exemplar. And my client stopped me right away and said, Guy, we hate that word. That's a $3 college word, which means it's about $30 nowadays in U.S. currency. And and he, But they hated that. It sounded very academic, and it was. And I said, well, how about master performer? And the head person said, oh, okay. Well, yeah, that works. That makes sense to us. But we're not going to let Guy run around our organization helping us, calling people exemplars. You know, so so the, my lesson in that was that I needed to really talk in the language. I've heard the I'd heard the notion of hey, speak in the language of your customers. You know, don't use your jargon. But there was this was right in my face, and I had to make a decision about using a different term, something that resonated, was well received by my audience, my customers, and made sense to them. And so that's the that's the problem with uh, Gilbert's behavior engineering model is that it uses a set of language and and wording that's very academic oriented and doesn't really translate well to the language of our customers. And so you learn it and and figure out how to adopt it and adapt it. And I would probably start with learning Carl Binder's six box model in his performance thinking network. Um, and he's got a lot of resources and such. I don't know his URL off the top of my head here, but he's easily found on LinkedIn. Um, you can find him online by, you know, Googling uh, performance thinking and you'll find it. He's got a bunch of videos and a bunch of uh, uh, things, I think, that really can help develop somebody's professional competence in this area of human performance technology and performance improvement. Okay, so, so thank you, Guy. And as we were talking, I was just thinking, most of the knowledge that we require, it already exists. It has been in existence for quite a while. And, and, I, and I don't know why, because I find joy reading books from 75, 80s. And, and, and Sometimes I ask, all this knowledge has already been here. Uh, why haven't we been you gotten to it, right? So I don't know. Is, is is there something you're seeing that maybe needs to stop and needs to or something else that needs to start? Well, I think it's just human nature in that most people, I think that you don't fit in the category of most people, but most people don't want to read long books. They want to get a short video and think that that's sufficient. And it's unfortunately, it's most of the time it's not. Um, so, but yeah, I think what your point was that, you know, most I, I've been saying that, you know, um, it's, well, Ina, 
what's old is new again. And Mm -hmm. I see the same things that I learned about in 1979, which meant they were invented back in the 60s and 70s. And I was learning them when I first joined a, a training services organization, my first job out of college. And I learned a lot of things that had been in existence and had been proven for over a decade before I started learning about them and using them. And there are some new things that have come along, but most of the things that we require as professionals who are trying to help our organizations improve through instructional interventions and non-instructional interventions, all of this stuff is is basically uh, been known for a long time. And the only thing that's really changed in the 40 four years now that I've been involved in this um, is the digital technology, the computer technology that has uh, affected how we do our work, uh, how we deploy our work, and how we administrate our work. But the basics of what it is that we do that is now digitally enabled is the same from the 60s and 70s. Um, Now, there are many bad practices, poor practices, and there are uh, some really good uh, practices, best practices, if you will, um, that need to be adapted rather than adopted. But still, there's good sources for what works under what conditions and what doesn't work under what conditions and much of this is lost now part of the i've heard about this issue since i first got in the business so this was not new in 1979 it's not new today it's age old and we have a churn in our ranks in the instructional design world in the learning experience world we have this churn people come in and then they leave so when you go to conferences They're always talking about the basics, all the entry-level stuff. Why? Because there are so many new people, brand spanking new, to the business, to the field, to the profession, that they need to be grounded in these foundational things. And so conferences attend to those. And then those people who have been to the conference for 10 years in a row, they get bored because there's nothing new for them. They need more intermediate and advanced topics and, and things to learn. And they may not be getting them well enough. That, and that's been a constant complaint. It was a complaint all through the 80s, through the 90s, and through the early 2000s. And I've not really been to uh, but a couple of conferences in the last 10 years. But 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 that's the age-old complaint. But most of the people at the conferences, they don't understand the complaints because they're brand new. And this is exactly what they need. But, but so people, uh, many people, practitioners and and the newer thought leaders they are borrowing things and changing them for marketing purposes they don't do what i think i've been doing for most of my career which is talking about i learned this from uh from tom gilbert i read it in his articles that he wrote i mean i met the man but he probably wouldn't be able to pick me out of a lineup but i learned from rumler and harless and other people and i i learned these things from them and i tend to use their names and i try to do my best although i don't do it perfectly is to attribute what i learned and where it came from because if you can learn from me and my writings and what i share you ought to also go back to the people that i reference and go read some of the original work because I've taken their work and I've adopted some of it, but most of it I have adapted. I've changed the language to fit my context, my world, my clients, my stakeholders, uh, so that it would fit with them. So it would be easy for them to understand, well, what the heck is guy talking about? Well, I need to make it easy for them, not difficult. And so I've changed it. I've made changes to it. And something might have been lost. There may have been aspects of what Rumler wrote and talked about and did that I've not, I don't I didn't carry forward. So it's good to learn from me and others in the current generation, uh, the younger generations. But the people that are no longer with us left us with a legacy of good work that is still valid today. 
The language may need to be refreshed because that's just how language works. It always evolves and changes. And so, you know, we got to get over the fact that, oh, they've changed the language. It used to be instruction, then it was training. Now it's learning. And now people are talking about, well, what's next? What should we call it next? You know, so there's no stopping that. You've just got to do the right. I mean, I didn't change my language from training to learning for the first 10 years that everybody else was changing their language from training to learning, all due to Peter Senge's The Fifth Discipline and the learning organization. You know, all my training clients that were training and development, they became learning and development because they thought they were the learning organization and central to learning. Well, that's not necessarily true, as we all know. Okay, so um, thanks, Guy, and, and I think it's been quite a wonderful learning. Well, you're welcome, Martin, and I'm and I'm glad we had this opportunity to talk. Um, you had some questions. I hope that I've given you a sufficient answer and didn't, you know, answer give you too long an answer. But, but, and thank you for allowing me to record this so that I can share this with others because that's what I'm trying to do nowadays. As I slip into full retirement. I'm not quite there yet, but uh, I want to share what I've learned uh, through my experiences, what I've learned through my own educational journey, learning from some of the masters who were involved in human performance technology and performance technology and total quality management and other aspects of business or organizational performance or enterprise performance. But but I wish you well, and uh, and if you want to do another round of this at some future point, uh, please let me know. But thank you, and and uh, for in inviting me to do this and allowing me to record it and share it, and uh, and I uh, hope to see you online. I, I see you're very active on LinkedIn, so I'm encouraging people to follow you. And as you share your you. learning journey, you know that could be helpful to many other people. Yep. Thank you. It's been a wonderful learning, and I'm also a very a beneficiary of your website. I learn a lot from it, right? Well, good. I'm 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 glad it's uh, serving some purpose, and that's that's the point of the whole thing. But yeah, uh, I'm going to let you go now, and uh, you have a great day. You too. Have a great day. All right. Thank you. Thank you.